kids are going to head out with Miss Joyce to Ogden Kids Worship. Amen. Well, I am excited to be back this week in the book of Ephesians, to be back with you guys this week. I missed y'all last week. But uh, I do want to thank you for the opportunity to take my family and go on vacation. And I'll tell you what, I don't know how restful the vacation it was, but it was fun. But thank you guys so much for allowing me that time. And if you would, turn with me this morning to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The video that we watched earlier was by a group known as The Bible Project. And the Bible Project does videos that kind of help summarize books of the Bible. They, they uh, break them down very succinctly and visually so that we can kind of see and track uh, the line of thinking and, and what's going on throughout uh, the books of the Bible. And I thought it was a good time as we reached the halfway point in the book of Ephesians. You saw in that video that Ephesians very neatly divides into two different halves, uh, with chapters 1 through 3 being the first half and then 4 through 6 being the second half, and not only in chapters does it split naturally, but thematically it splits naturally, with the first three chapters dealing mostly with doctrine, and specifically the gospel story, and then chapters four through six detailing more about our story and how do we live out the truths of the gospel uh, in our daily lives. So as we get started this morning, let's begin our time together by reading from God's Word in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. It says this, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. Let's pray together as we get started. Father God, we thank you that you are with us. We as your people can gather together and study your word, Father, and seek your face, and that you, Lord, have revealed yourself to us through your word. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. Lord, we thank you for all these things we've seen in the book of Ephesians so far, just the abundant richness of the blessings that you have lavished upon us, the grace that you have given us. And Lord, we cannot help but be thankful. And Lord, as we live our lives in light of all that you have done, may we even, as this verse says, strive to live our lives in a manner and to have our walk be in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called. Lord, now as we come to this time of studying your word and looking at your word, God, I pray that it is impossible for us in our own strength and our own efforts to even glean a portion of the riches that are here. And yet, Lord, we need you to open our eyes and our hearts so that we might, as the psalmist says, see and behold wonderful things out of your law. So Lord, help us, lead us, guide us, and strengthen us, that we, your people, may live for you each and every day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So this whole section here of Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 16, serves as a whole unit looking at how a biblically healthy community of the church should function. Over the next several weeks, we're going to be looking at three specific areas of a biblically healthy church. 
those three areas that we're going to be looking at, we're going to see kind of three different areas that rise to the top. There's a lot of things that we could point to when we think about a healthy church and what a healthy church should, should be like and how they should function. But the three key things that seem to kind of rise out of this passage is that a healthy church will be characterized by unity, diversity, and maturity. Unity. There's going to be a oneness to what they're doing. We're going to see that today. Diversity. There's going to be differences that God is bringing all kinds of different people together with different skills and different gifts and maybe different backgrounds, bringing them together into this one beautiful body of the church. And then there will be maturity. People growing in their faith, growing in their likeness of Christ and in their pursuit of Christ. As I said, this week, the main idea of this message is that a healthy church is marked by spiritual unity. See, unity is about so much more than just a lack of conflict. Sometimes we think of unity as just meaning we haven't had any fights in the church in a while, and so therefore we must be unified, right? Not necessarily. In fact, I might even add that one of the most dangerous kinds of disunity exists when no one is on the same page and we're just content to be that way. Where everyone is off doing their own thing, but there's no really larger purpose or larger plan or even mission that's being served or that's driving our focus and our, and our efforts. Instead, unity, the kind that Paul is urging the Ephesian church here to maintain and likewise urging us to maintain is all about striving together hand in hand with a common purpose. See, what we will see here is that this passage provides us as the church a means to evaluate whether or not we are a healthy church or not. And if we find ourselves to be lacking in that way, it gives us some plans, some blueprints about what we can do about it. So why is unity such a foundational element of a biblically healthy community? We're going to see three different reasons why unity is so important to us and why we must prioritize being a church that is centered around a unified effort. The first thing we're going to see here is that we as the church have been united by a divine calling. We've been united by a divine calling. He says there in verse 1, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He starts with that phrase, I, therefore. And I heard a seminary professor years ago tell me that whenever you see the word, therefore, you need to look back and see what it's. Therefore. There you go. You guys have heard me say that before. And so in this case, what he's doing is he's pointing us back to the entirety of what has been covered in chapters 1 through 3. And just like the video said, that therefore really serves as a link between the gospel story in the first half of Ephesians and how the gospel then impacts our story, our lives in the second half of the book of Ephesians. Just an interesting side fact for you about the book of Ephesians, that there are 41 imperatives, that means commands, things that Paul is specifically and expressly saying, do this or don't do this. There are 41 imperatives in the entire book of Ephesians. Now, of those 41 commands, one of them is found in chapters 1 through 3, and 40 of them are found in chapters 4 through 6. Meaning there's going to be a lot of things in these next few chapters where Paul is saying, hey, do this or don't do this. There's going to be a lot of commands for us to follow and do. And for the most part, if we think about it, we like commands because commands are clear. Do this or don't do this. It gives us something that we can kind of measure. But before we start making our checklist, it's like Paul tells us here to pause. And to take a deep breath because our walk, what we do, must be grounded upon what we believe 
Otherwise, it doesn't work. Do you hear me, church? What we do must be grounded upon what we believe or otherwise it doesn't work. If we as a church are only telling believers what they should do and not do, but we aren't leading them to a deeper devotion to Christ, to a more intimate love of Christ and understanding of a relationship with Christ, we will not make Christian followers Christ followers. We will instead make legalistic hypocrites. We will make people who find the entirety of their worth in their performance and their ability to check a box rather than to trust a people or to, rather than make a people who are trusting in the sufficiency and supremacy of Christ. So Paul tells us to stop, to wait, to listen. And he reminds us here of our divine calling of the biblical foundation that has been laid for us in chapters 1 through 3. And he says here, I, therefore, in light of all of these things, in light of the grace of Christ and the richness of Christ and the fact that God has raised, raised us from death to life in Christ and he's unified us into one body of the church in Christ. And because of all of this, I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you, compel you, challenge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. See, Paul is going to use this phrase to walk quite a bit. In fact, he uses it 33 times throughout all of his known writings. But here in the book of Ephesians, eight different times, in these, short, in these six chapters, he uses this picture of to walk in reference to the Christian life. Now what he means here when he urges the Ephesian believers to walk in this way is he's just speaking about the ordinary rhythms of the Christian life. It's not anything spectacular or special. It's just as you go through life, your walk is how you respond and act and live and follow Jesus. For that reason, this walk that he keeps coming back to should be the experience of every believer that is serving Christ and seeking to be obedient. I find it absolutely fascinating that out of all the terminology that Paul could have chosen, out of all the words that he could have used for the Christian life, he could have said the Christian life is an adventure or a journey. But out of all of his terms he could have chosen, his favorite that he uses to describe the Christian life is to describe it as a walk. And that's what he does over and over and over again. Look at Ephesians 2, 1 through 2. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world. It's like he's saying, you used to be dead in your trespasses and sins. You were walking the wrong way, but now God has given you a new way to walk if you're in Him. Ephesians 2.10 tells us that when it says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And Ephesians 5 verse 2 says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave, up, and gave Himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Ephesians 5 8, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. And then Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, Look carefully then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. I think that a walk is such a powerful picture of the Christian life, and I think it is such a powerful picture for several reasons. I've listed here just a couple. One, there is an intentionality in a walk. And intentionality. Especially in Paul's day, because the primary means by which people traveled would have been to walk. They didn't have cars and bicycles and all the other things that we have today to get around and 
Uh, but instead, the primary means of walking or the primary means of travel in that day would have been to walk. So the idea of walk, when Paul mentions it here, would have, include, would have included intentionally heading towards a desired destination. It's going somewhere. In the same way, our walk with Christ should have, have an element of intentionality to it. It should be going somewhere. Meaning that our relationship with Christ should be growing and maturing. And a walk communicates a certain layer of purpose and direction that you and I are called to have in our lives. We say it this way sometimes, that we haven't been saved to sit, we've been saved to serve. Our lives when we're in Christ, we don't just come and get saved and then just say, okay, well I did that, I checked that box, I'm good to just exist for the next you know, however many years until I die and go to glory. No. The Christian life is a walk. It's progressive. We should be closer with Christ because we've walked longer with Him the longer we are a follower of Jesus. Meaning that the longer we've been a follower of Jesus, guess what? The more we should look like Jesus. Sometimes the opposite happens. Sometimes we get older and we get kind of grumpy and get set in our ways and we don't like change and we don't like this. And so we just kind of go... Mm. Mm, yeah. <laughs> the reality is that the longer we walk with Christ, the more intentional we are in that walk as we seek to be like Jesus. We are blessed to have some godly senior adults here who have walked with Jesus for decades. I was talking to the staff this week, one of the greatest blessings in this church, it's, it's this hidden secret of Ogden is that we have so many godly grandparents and senior adults that just love children and love families and want to just pour that love and life into them. What an incredible blessing it is to have so many of you here who have intentionally walked with Christ all these years. What a blessing. So there is intentionality in a walk. There's also intricacy in a walk. By intricacy, I mean that there are complexities to a walk. Rarely is a path only straight and easy. Usually there are variations. There's uphills and downhills. There's smooth and rocky terrain. And the reality is that life is like that, isn't it? Jesus doesn't promise us to make every road free of potholes. But, he does, but what He does promise us is to walk with us in the midst of life, seasons, and trials. And when you stumble and fall, He's there to pick you up. In those uphill seasons when it's hard to climb, He provides you the encouragement and the strength that is needed, and He carries you through it. And through it all, through all of life's journeys, the ups and downs, the ins and outs, the good, the bad, we get to experience this sweet fellowship with you who have walked throughout your life and you've been through some of the hardest times you can give some of the greatest testimony to the presence of Christ in the midst of your suffering and trials. What a blessing it is to have experienced the intricacies of this walk, the ups and downs, and know that Christ is faithful no matter what comes. And then finally, there is intimacy in a walk. There's something about taking a walk together that's just very special. There's a sign of intimacy to it. I think I've shared with this with you before, but one of my favorite memories, it's one of the things I point to in me and Amanda's marriage that was really part of the foundations that has allowed us over these last 15 years. And I realized we've got a long way to go to catch some of you guys but I believe we've got a, a wonderful marriage, a strong marriage. And one of the things that I pointed to, one of my clearest memories is in those first few years, as we were just figuring out what it looks like to be married and we were wrestling with having two separate lives become one life, one of the things that we did, we moved the week after we got married, we moved to Wake Forest, North Carolina, for me to attend seminary. And one of our favorite things to do at night 
because it's a really neat community. It's very uh, almost like a step back in time. It's it's a seminary community, and so that section of Wake Forest is just very uh, protected. So we would walk up to the camp seminary campus, and at night it's well lit. We would just walk around the campus, and we would talk about our days, and we would talk about our dreams. We didn't have any kids at that point. We would talk about our future, and we would talk about children. We would talk about all these different things. And it was at that, it was during those walks that my love for my wife just grew exponentially. Because there's an intimacy in walking together. In the same way, there's a sweet intimacy to our walk with Jesus. To a life that has learned the beautiful depth and meaning that is offered to every individual that learns to walk with Him and trust in Him and lean on Him. One last thing I want to highlight here in verse 1 is that Paul says something here, at least when I read it, Paul's wording is just a little bit strange. He says here, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the call into which you have been called. And the question that I had was, why does he include this phrase, a prisoner for the Lord? I mean, it's not really needed in the sentence to make the sentence make sense. So why then does Paul add this in at this particular point? I mean, if you remember, Paul is writing this whole book while under arrest in Rome. But I think it's more than just him reminding them of his situation. He's already done that to some extent. I think there are two primary reasons why Paul includes this idea of being a prisoner for the Lord at this particular point. I think, one, he wants them to understand that walking in this way, walking in obedience to Christ, very realistically might lead you here. That if you are faithfully following Christ, then walking with Him in obedience, there are always going to be those who would oppose you. So in that way, it's similar to what Jesus even says in Luke chapter 14 when He urges those who would seek to follow after Him to count the cost in Luke 14, verse 28. But another thing that I think he's trying to communicate here is he wants them to understand that walking in this way, walking in this way and experiencing this relationship with Christ is worth being in there as a prisoner of the Lord. It's worth it. There is not one ounce of regret in Paul's voice. It's actually quite the opposite. He knows that no matter what may come, it's worth it to have Jesus. And Paul would echo this sentiment at other times throughout his ministry. At the more that he walked with Christ, and Paul underwent some incredible hardship. And yet he knew that it was great, that he would endure it all and do it willingly because it meant that he got to understand and know Christ in a deeper way. Look at what Philippians 3.8 tells us. Philippians 3.8 says this, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Jesus talks about a treasure in the field that somebody who finds it, they go and they sell everything they own so they can go and purchase that field because they understand that this treasure is of infinite value. And it's like Paul is saying, I have found that treasure. There is nothing that this world has or that it could possibly offer me. No fleeting pleasure, no temporary gain that would even hold a candle to the glorious reality of knowing Christ Jesus my Savior. It's nothing. It's all rubbish, he says. It's trash. It's filth. The best this world has to offer is trash compared to Christ. And so he says, I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, gladly urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. He isn't calling us here to simply a further obligation as if we had to earn what Christ has done for us. 
Instead, Paul is saying that when you realize the depth of Christ's love, the riches of his grace, the beauty of the life that he offers, when you understand that, that understanding is going to drive you and should absolutely affect how you live your life. The ins and outs, the ups and downs, the details of your life. It's going to affect your walk, which leads us to point number two here of how we should be united. Yes, we, should be, we are united in a divine calling, but we also should be united by a Christ-like conduct. We are united by Christ-like conduct. Look at verses 2 and 3. It says, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So the question here is, well, if we're called to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called, what does this walk look like? And he tells us here that if the church is going to maintain a spirit of unity, both we as individuals and the church corporately should be characterized, and he's going to give us five different characteristics of a walk that is worthy. And what I want you to notice here, he's going to give you these five different characteristics. But what I want you to notice is that each of these characteristics, if you live them out, you know what you're going to look like? Jesus. Because Jesus is the ultimate example of all of these qualities. He's the ultimate picture of all of these lived out to the fullest. And so if we as believers are living like this, then by default, we're not going to look like the world. We're not going to be walking in the ways of the world like Ephesians 2 talked about. But we're going to start walking and looking and acting and speaking and loving in the same way that Christ did. Look at these five qualities. The first one is this. Humility. Humility. He says, walk in the, uh, in a, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility. See, church, understand this. For unity to exist, humble, selfless people must be living for the good of others rather than just for the good of themselves. Y'all hear me? Write that down, put it on a, on a pillow, crochet it. I don't know what you got to do, but you remember that. All right? For unity to exist, humble, selfless people must be living for the good of others, not just for themselves. This means we're not living for ourselves. We're not demanding our own wants and likes, but instead we're willing to say, Lord, whatever is best for your kingdom, that's what I want. God, whatever is going to glorify you the most, that's what I want. The problem is that this goes against every single inclination of our human nature, and our enemy knows it. He knows that we're prone to focus on ourselves. He knows that we're prone to want what we want and like what we like and demand what we demand. And so God tells us that if we are going to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, we must actively combat that selfish nature that plagues every single one of us. And we do this by walking in a spirit of humility. This would have been absolutely foreign to the people in Paul's day. Frank Thielman actually notes that, interestingly, the term humility was uncommon in the first century Greek literature. When it did appear, it was almost always used with a negative connotation. In that day, in that society, pride was much more highly valued. And Christians were actually ridiculed for being a people who walk in humility. Church, we live in a very similar day today. See, the opposite of humility, as I said, is self-exaltation. See, our culture is telling us that you should exalt yourself, pamper yourself, think about yourself first, serve yourself, or better yet, have others serve you. And at the center of this is all this nasty little four-letter word, self. We must become a people who are abundantly selfless. 
if we want to accomplish all that Christ has called us to do. If we want to be a healthy church that is growing and flourishing and passing on the message of the gospel, we must get out of our own self and seek to serve Christ. I love what Timothy Keller says. He puts it this way. That the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself, but it is thinking of myself less. It must be a people that are focused on Christ. Second, the second characteristic he gives us here is gentleness. Gentleness. And gentleness does not mean timidity, but it involves being kind of mild in spirit or ultimately self-controlled. See, Moses in Numbers 12 verse 3 was described as the meekest man in, on the face of the earth. And yet he was a dynamic leader who challenged the power of the throne of Egypt. His strength stood under God's control, not in his own flesh. In 1 Timothy 3 verse 3, pastors are called to exemplify Christ's likeness. And they're called to not be bullies, not pushing their own ways, but instead to be gentle. In Galatians 5.23, gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. And in, chapter, in Galatians 6, verse 1, it is the way that we are called to care for one another with all gentleness. See, the tendency is, if we're not careful, to be harsh. And we say all kinds of different ways, oh, well, I'm just speaking truth, oh, I'm just doing this, that, or the other. But the reality is we're called to be gentle and loving the way Christ was. Third is patience. Patience. I learned a long time ago that there's one thing you don't want to pray for, it's patience, because God has a funny way of answering that prayer. And usually He answers that prayer by sending you someone there or something there that's going to try your patience. But I have this phrase written in this verse in my Bible. I write notes in my Bible, and I hear, I don't know, at some point I probably heard a pastor say this, and I just wrote it down because I thought it was pretty powerful. But it says this, that patience is the intersection between love and wisdom. Patience is the intersection between love and wisdom. In that moment when I want to respond in my flesh, to my children or my spouse. My love for them and the wisdom that God is giving me should keep me from exercising what I want to say in that moment. Why? That's patience. So patience is the intersection between love and wisdom. I know so many times we want to we see things, maybe on Facebook or online, or we have somebody say something to us, and our first response is that we want to just Go off on them. Maybe we would be better served being patient and modeling patience in this way. Finally, bearing with one another in love. This means to put up with each other in love. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 4, 8. He says that, lover, that, that love covers a multitude of sins. I mean, we understand this, right? I mean, this is, how, this is the only way marriage can work. Listen, if I had to put up with me, somebody would have probably already been dead. But thank goodness my wife loves me, and she puts up with a lot. She's got a lot of extra jewels coming her way in her crown one day. As believers who are walking in a manner worthy of the calling to which we've been called, we will bear with one another in Love. And then finally, it says that we will be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You understand this, church. Unity is not just something that naturally happens. It's something you have to fight for. In fact, unity is not just a passive activity. It is an active activity. Pursuit. You don't get to just sit back and all of a sudden say, oh, well, there's unity. 
But notice what it says here. It says that we should be zealous. We should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. Now, that's interesting because what that tells us is it's not something that we initiate. The Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit is the one who initiates unity. That's why it's called the unity of the Spirit. But it is something that we must diligently work to keep, to maintain with the help of the Spirit. See, in order for these qualities to grow and thrive, we must not only pursue each and every one of them, but it means that we must be willing to renounce the opposites of these. We must be willing to renounce that self-centeredness, to renounce and choose, uh, instead of choosing harshness, choose gentleness. Instead of choosing self-centeredness, choosing humility. Instead of choosing the tyranny of our own agendas, we must walk in patience with one another. Instead of setting up idealist, idealistic expectations that are too hard for anybody to live with, we must bear with one another in love. And then instead of living in different and passive lives, we must be eager as the church to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. See, the church is unified and God is glorified when we live with such Christ life. And the last thing I want us to see as we close here is this. That we must be united by the gospel confession. We must be united by a gospel confession. In verses 4 through 6, make what was probably, Paul is probably here citing what would have been an early Christian creed. And I know Hollis, a few uh, months back, talked about creeds and kind of how they were early declarations of faith, that they would try to make succinct statements that were easy to memorize so that they could teach them to others and so that they could remember this doctrine as they would share it with others. And so the glorious reality is that we get to share the same message. We get to proclaim the goodness of our God. I gave you guys a challenge on Wednesday. I told you guys on Wednesday that I challenged the staff at our staff meeting this week to find at least one person this week in your path. And you have to be intentional about it because God is going to put people in your way. But you have to be ready and willing and looking for those opportunities. And so I challenged the staff this week to identify and find at least one person to share the gospel with. And then we're going to come together on Tuesday at staff meeting, and we're just going to share the stories of, of who God has allowed us to talk to this week and, and, and the ways that we've been able to share the gospel this week. And I challenged you guys last Wednesday, if you were here, uh, to do the same thing. Look this week as you go, as you go out to lunch after you leave here, as you run to the grocery store this week, as you go to work or school or wherever you may go, God is going to place, if you're, if you're ready and willing and praying and seeking for God to do so, God is going to put somebody in your path this week that needs to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to challenge you to look for those divine appointments. Look for those divine opportunities. And then when the opportunity comes, don't miss it. But tell them of the love of Jesus. I would love Wednesday night at Praise and Grace for us to be able to sit around and do nothing but share these gospel stories of how God has used us this week as we sought to tell others about the love of Christ. I think that's what Paul is saying here. Is he's highlighting, and he's going to highlight seven different statements, seven different one statements about all the things that they as believers have in common, about the glorious confession that they get to share uh, as believers in Christ. And so he says there in verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to the one hope that belongs to your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We could go through each of those and highlight all that they are and what they mean. But I think the point of what Paul is saying here is that this world oftentimes likes to highlight our differences. This world loves to point out the ways that we're different and then prey upon those things. Things that create division and animosity and tension between different groups. 
And it's like Paul, and it's like the Lord here knows this. And so he tells Paul to share this truth. That no matter what we might have different, that no matter what, and we're going to look at that next week, that, that, that God, that one of the benefits of the church, one of the characteristics of a healthy church is spiritual diversity, meaning that we do have differences. But it's like he wants to make it sure we know here that no matter what those differences may be that would try to separate us, what we have together in common is far and abundantly greater. We have one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body of the church, one God and Father of all. So we can celebrate in the beautiful, glorious Unity of the church. Church. A healthy church. A church that's going to make a difference. It's a church that's going to fight for unity. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for this day.